The iconic Halloween costumes of Euphoria are incredibly deceiving. They're visually stunning, but story-wise, depressing. Each character references a cult movie that parallels their current struggle. Forbidden love, hopeless romance, rebellion, and control. The Halloween episode is one of my favorite episodes because it's a turning point in the season. The characters begin to unravel and their previous actions are used against them. The costumes intentionally reflect what happens. There is a fantastic video already on YouTube by Modern Girl that discusses the characters' overall styles in each season. I also have a playlist of shorts about their color palettes and makeup evolution, and I'll link both if you're interested. But here, we're going to analyze these specific costumes in depth and narrow our focus to how they relate to this episode because there is a lot to unpack. Rue is dressed as Amy Jolly, a cabaret singer from the 1930 movie Morocco. In a particularly famous scene, the character is in a suit as she serenades the audience. Rue's version is similar, including a coat tail, bow tie, and simplified waistcoat. A top hat was created to match her outfit, but they scrapped it because it didn't practically work for filming. I actually think this lack of detail works really well for Rue. I love how you can see her messy self-made bob and an attempt to replicate the short hairstyle in the original. She isn't as particular as the others. Her style is laid back and casual. I think Rue wouldn't care if her costume wasn't 100% accurate anyway, as long as it's passable. This scene from Morocco is famous because Amy's outfit is matched masculine and she cheekily kisses another woman. Both were scandalous at the time. Rue's style is the most boyish out of all the girls. In fact, many of Rue's outfits include pieces from the boys section. This suit is actually a tuxedo for little boys. Rue is also in love with a girl. Dressing up for Halloween seems uncharacteristic for her, or at least is something that she'd be indifferent to. But she knows that Jules loves it and so makes the effort to impress her with a creative idea. Amy is played by Marlene Dietrich, who is known for her gender-bending fashion and androgynous film roles and bisexuality. Rue references a character who fits her stylistically and who represents a meaningful moment in film for gender expression and sexuality. Morocco also features a love triangle. Amy has a complicated romance with a womanizer and is pursued by a wealthier man. Rue isn't the center of a traditional love triangle, but she is in between her obsessive love for Jules and her desire for drugs. Like the womanizer in Morocco, Jules has a history of hookups and is naturally flirty. While Rue and Jules are never exclusive in season one, she does tease her and toy with her emotions. In Morocco, Amy is the first person who gives her love interest hope for the future. In a similar vein, Jules is the first person to give Rue hope away from drugs. The drugs in this case are the shiny, wealthy man parallel in the love triangle, an empty happiness without meaning, only a lot more lethal. In the Halloween episode, we see the consequences this love triangle has for Rue. Rue has chosen Jules over drugs and is so Sober, but Jules rejects her advances and gets drunk herself. Rue is left to awkwardly navigate the party and take care of her. Unable to quote, have fun, in other words, drink, and misunderstanding Jules' behavior, she concludes she's a burden. Rue is afraid to lose Jules because of her addictive personality. She can't be the person Jules deserves if she's using or if she's sober. This is ultimately why she relapses at the end of the season, choosing drugs over Jules because she couldn't leave with her to go to the city. Her makeup here is a smoky glitter eye. It's her signature going out look. It's messy and imprecise, matching her casual attitude. The under eye glitter is reminiscent of tears. Rue has a panic attack in the bathroom and breaks down to Lexi. This makeup is also essential to convey her mental state during her manic episode later. At the party, Rue realizes Nate might be the reason Jules is acting out. Rue becomes so fixated on this that she doesn't sleep or wash her face. The glitter flecks from Halloween remain days later. The smokiness becomes smudged making her look sleepless. I love this subtle detail to convey how all-consuming Rue's mania is, and how she might appear somewhat crazier to the other characters. Morocco is about a difficult love. Rue's story is also about love, her love for jewels, drugs, and herself, and the impact they have on her life choices. And we can see the emotional roller coaster this is for Rue in this episode. Jules is dressed as Juliet from the 1996 adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Jules's outfit is almost a perfect match to her reference. The dress is vintage, sourced from Poshmark, and the wings were custom made from the feather shop Mother Plucker in LA. It's the same shop which reportedly made the wings for Romeo and Juliet. Jules completes the look down to the accessories, including Juliet's cross necklace. Jules has an ethereal, fairy-like quality to her style, so an angel is fitting, but this costume is also very different than her daily fashion. Jules is visually expressive and wears plenty of layers, patterns, and textures. This look 
is simple. But this difference makes sense since Jules is distracted and not herself. She uncharacteristically drinks, and when Rue tells her she looks amazing, she says that she doesn't feel like it. Her distracted headspace is better reflected through her makeup. Artistic and sensitive, Jules uses makeup to creatively express her emotions. When she becomes stressed, she wears bright red slash orange eyeshadow. It makes her look tired, sleepless, and on edge. The gold flakes are her creative, angelic touch, but they peel away as she becomes more drunk and reckless, revealing how her life is unraveling. Romeo and Juliet is famously about forbidden love. One of the reasons there are so many crosses in the movie, aside from the religious reference, is to reflect the star-crossed lovers. Jules's relationship with love is tumultuous. She finds a false sense of acceptance by hooking up with various men. She cares for Rue, but to be her sole source of sobriety is overwhelming. She's attracted to Nate's, but repulsed by his evil nature. Her concept of femininity and self-love depends on heteronormal Normative men loving her. Rue doesn't necessarily fit into that box. Up until now, Jules has desired a passionate, authentic, masculine love, like Romeo has for Juliet. This diversion from her plan adds to Jules's confused emotions. Romeo and Juliet also both die in the end. At this point, Rue and Jules's lives are threatened. Rue because of her use of drugs, and Jules because of Nate's violent personality. But what makes more sense to me isn't the death of these characters, it's the inevitable death of their relationship. By the end of season one, they aren't together, and it's the same again in season two. Rue and Jules also sound like the modern names for Romeo and Juliet. At the Romeo and Juliet party, the costumes are supposed to reflect the characters' as true selves, a pure angel and a knight in shining armor. But at this party, Jules is deceitful. She is no angel. She has lied about her age on dating sites, sent revealing underage photos, and has just lied to the police. Even though she was coerced, it's still wrong. In this episode, Jules rejects Rue's advances because she's stressed about Nate. The previous night, he used her photos to blackmail her to help drop his assault case. With seemingly no choice, Jules tells the police that Tyler hit Maddie. This is illegal and punishable for up to seven years in prison. Jules drinks to forget and doesn't have the mental capacity to think about her relationship with Rue. The pool scene is a reference to a similar scene in Romeo and Juliet, where in both instances, the characters kiss. Jules recites a verse from Act to scene two in the play. And if we interpret the Shakespearean prose, essentially she's saying, I like you, but I'm overwhelmed with emotion. I feel rushed and I need time. But by the next time we meet, I will give you my love. These lines foreshadow what happens in their relationship. Jules is drowning in her relationship with Rue and has so much else going on. Jules leaves for the city to clear her head and eventually commits to Rue in season two. Kat is dressed as Thana from Miss 45. As Kat explains in the show, Thana is a mute seamstress who is sexually assaulted, then avenges herself by killing men, including at a Halloween party when she's dressed as a nun. Kat's interpretation of the nun costume is fashion forward. She wears a black slip with a body harness, a custom-made latex habit, a reworked vintage cape, and multiple rosaries. Thana's story mirrors Kat's. Like Thana, Kat is initially reserved and voiceless, but after an explicit tape of her leaks, she reclaims the narrative by sexually using men to feel power. The bad girl nun is her way of disproving the innocent good girl everyone viewed her as. Miss 45 is about revenge. Kat's reference to it reflects the frustrations she has with men. In Miss 45, Thana's revenge begins by killing her attackers, but she is eventually driven by blind hatred of men in general and kills for far less. This is like Kat, where a couple traumatic experiences have made her jaded against all guys, so Kat will find a way to reject a guy even if he has good intentions. For example, Ethan assumes she's just a slutty nun, but her costume has meaning and a specific reference. Kat has a deeper relation to media and movie references than the others. As a child, she lived vicariously through romance movies. When she becomes Tumblr famous, she imagines herself as a Game of Thrones-esque queen. Ethan misjudging her outfit reinforces her view that men are pathetic, even uncultured. But this is unfair since he just hasn't seen the movie and a sexy nun is a plausible Halloween costume. While Ethan misjudges Kat, so does Kat to Ethan. Kat's costume is very interesting to me because she also wears a costume in her daily life. This dominatrix look is not Kat's authentic self. It's a mask for her insecurities. Kat is only confident in her ability to please men, not her self-worth. Her Halloween costume is another excuse to fictionalize herself. But interestingly, there is some truth to it. Thana wears a simple outfit, but Kat's version has sexier dominatrix additions like the latex and body harness. They're both a 
that nod to her hidden identity as a cam girl. Both Kat and Thana have empowerment scenes where they don red lipstick. Red is bold, attention-grabbing, and lustful. It's the moment they decide to be rebellious and take matters into their own hands. Kat's makeup with her upside-down crosses are meant to be daring and anti-conforming. She's no longer afraid to push boundaries and be controversial. By this point in the season, Kat is thriving in her business. She's fully committed to her sexual self and the money she's making is reinforcing her sexual value. While she doesn't crash the party like Thana, she is, however, quite mean to Ethan, which drives him to prove himself to her. Then she stands him up and turns to Daniel, choosing to reclaim the scummy boy who broke her heart over genuine goodness. Like Thana, her negative view of men is leading her down a path of dark choices. Even though we can understand why Kat feels this way and what happened to her in the past is not okay, what she's doing now is also not okay. But this episode is a turning point for her since it's the first time she receives pleasure rather than gives it. This is crucial because Kat has only performed sexual acts as a form of dominance, not as a form of intimacy or mutual connection. It isn't until the next episode where she learns Daniel doesn't even remember dating her that she starts to question her actions, ultimately leading her away from an extremist like Thana. Cassie is dressed as Alabama Worley from the 1993 film True Romance. Alabama is a call girl who falls in love with the guy she's hired to sleep with. Cassie's rendition includes a skirt from A Doll's Kill and Delia's collaboration, earrings sourced from Amazon, and cowboy boots from a brand called Liberty. The bra was dyed by the costume designer to be the right shade of blue. Cassie's color palette is limited to baby blues and pinks, so a blue Halloween costume makes sense for her. Cassie has a sexual reputation. Since her father left when she was young, she seeks male validation through sexual partners. She easily falls in love, often with guys who don't respect her and who take advantage of her soft nature. Cassie is desperate for love. Alabama is a projection of the love she wants, a love so consuming they'll do anything for her no matter her sexual history. Alabama's most iconic outfit is probably her leopard print pants. This outfit is only worn by her for a very quick scene, but a key one. It is in fact the scene where they hook up in the telephone booth, which Daniel references at the party. True romance can also be seen as a male fantasy. Alabama is so in awe of her lover who wants to be a hero and save her from her pimp. Cassie often views herself through a male fantasy lens and lacks a sense of self. However, Alabama does have agency and can fend for herself. And I think that's where the projection comes in again. Cassie's sense of self is something she needs to define. Cassie's style doesn't have a strong sense of identity. Her Halloween look is the first form of individuality and creativity we see from her, especially with her bold makeup. Cassie's makeup is usually simple and conventionally attractive, but here it looks like the stage makeup she would have worn for ice skating before she had to quit. Cassie puts a lot of effort into this look and she's very proud of it. When Cassie shows off her outfits, her mom validates how great she looks. Her mom does this consistently and it's one reason why Cassie views her body as the most desirable thing about her. Cassie goes to two Halloween parties but only wears this costume once. And this is where we really understand Cassie's desire to have a life like Alabama. For the college party, Cassie's boyfriend, McKay, is uncomfortable with how sexual her outfit is. And this is because he's uncomfortable comfortable with her sexual past, so he gets her to change. This is exactly what Cassie doesn't want, to be negatively judged for her image, especially by her boyfriend. McKay is more concerned about what people will think of him being with her rather than his own girlfriend's feelings. He desperately wants to be accepted and so is careful to not do anything that would ruin his image with the guys. Unfortunately, he's still humiliated in a hazing ritual and then he aggressively takes his rage out on Cassie. At Daniel's party, Cassie finally gets to wear the costume she's so proud of. Daniel compliments her and he understands the reference. These are two things which McKay did not do. He makes her feel understood and valued. And since she's fighting with McKay, she hooks up with him. Daniel is dressed as the serial killer Ted Bundy. He is coincidentally disguising his evil intentions. Daniel preys on her. He lies about liking her and gets angry when she avoids going further with him. He calls her boring, the type of person you'd want to sleep with but not have a relationship with. It's awful, but in some ways, he's right. But it's because she's scarred from her broken family. She threw herself at boys because she was told she's beautiful and was never encouraged to expand her identity outside of that. In fact, the one thing she had, ice skating, was taken away from her. No wonder she's so proud of her costume. It's the first independent thing we've seen her do since ice skating. This might be a 
semi-valid read of Cassie. But you still don't say that to someone. Additionally, Daniel's earlier compliments are shallow because they weren't genuine, just a means to get her into bed. And this reinforces her fear of only being viewed sexually and not being loved for the person she is. But Daniel isn't the only guilty one. Cassie did lead him on, and Cassie has now cheated on McKay. Cassie's idea of a loving fairy tale is a desperate illusion. It's something she does to herself and to something society does to her. It's so unfortunate that she can't have the true romance she so desperately craves. Maddie is dressed as Iris, who is a child prostitute from the movie Taxi Driver. You don't see much of Maddie's costume, but her top does have hand embroidered appliques, just like in the movie. Her outfit is fairly similar to the reference. The only difference is her makeup. It's glittery and dramatic. She takes advantage of Halloween and creates a look that matches her outfits, not the movie. Matching her makeup to her outfits is a common theme for Maddie because of her strong sense of self. She enters the party with Nate, who is dressed as a jailed prisoner. His costume is generic and nowhere near the same level of creativity. Iris is just 12 years old working for a pimp. Maddie lost her virginity at 14 to an older man. Even though she says she was in control, this is likely not accurate given the significant age gap and underage consent. Iris says she can leave her situation at any time but chooses to stay because they protect her. But the taxi driver who tries to save her is also a little crazy. Something the taxi driver and Nate share is their obsession with proving themselves a hero through violence. Maddie is highly confident and attracted to Nate because of his protectiveness. She loves that he'd kill for her, but she chooses to ignore how unhealthy his violent tendencies are and stays in a toxic relationship. Both Maddie and Iris are disillusioned by the control they think they have and their exploitative situations. In this episode, Maddie goes back to Nate even though he is under investigation for assaulting her, which he definitely did do. They continue to be volatile. Maddie doesn't leave him because she doesn't want a failed relationship like her parents. This is similar to Iris who is afraid of leaving. She doesn't know how to live any other way. Nate's costume is perfect for him because he literally is a criminal. So far, he's beaten up Tyler, abused Maddie and blackmailed Jules, and just released from jail. Nate has a conventional masculine style that does not push boundaries. It makes sense that his Halloween outfit is the least creative and uninspired. He probably bought it last minute. In this episode, we learn that Nate has been watching Jules and blackmails her to frame Tyler. Then he extorts Tyler to confess to hitting Maddie. He's completely unemotional about both confrontations. Tyler's injuries are a result of Nate beating him up earlier, and Nate couldn't care less. Nate enters his party as a free man. His costume is very twisted because it signals that he recognizes the accusations but rejects them by mocking the situation. This requires a pretty high level of confidence and narcissism. Even though Nate isn't dressed as the main character in Taxi Driver, they do share one other similarity. The taxi driver is seen as a hero in the end for freeing Iris, but we know the truth. This act was out of convenience. His original plan is derailed and this is the next best thing to let out his rage. This is like Nate. It's haunting how everyone cheers for him when we know he's guilty. And something I found out is that Heidi Bivens, who's a costume designer, isn't leading the costume design for season three. So I wonder how it's going to change. Do you have a favorite costume in this episode? Subscribe for more analysis. I hope you have a lovely night and that it's not as depressing as Euphoria's show. Thank you so much for watching.